RNA is an informational molecule. If one would want a simple um, analogy for it, you might use the analogy of a videotape. It's, it has a linear array of information, uh, which by itself uh, is typically thought of not doing anything, just like a, a VCR tape doesn't do anything unless you have a machine to put it into and a monitor to, to look at the image. But it's the storehouse of the information. It can, the bits of information are called nucleotides, and they're chemically uh, almost identical to the four bits of information that make up the DNA um, double helix. Instead of A, G, C, and T, the abbreviations are A, G, C, and U, where in fact U is just a slight chemical uh, derivative of, of, of T, or those of us who believe in the RNA world like to think of you know, DNA as being just a modified RNA molecule, so then you would say T, thymine is just a derivative of uracil, which is the which is the RNA base. But um, the other distinction between DNA and RNA uh, is, as you would guess from the term deoxyribose nucleic acid, that there is a missing oxygen in DNA. So RNA has, has an extra oxygen atom on each of the sugars of the repeating units. Uh, finally, the DNA is a double helix, as every school kid knows, uh, and uh, but if you think about it, each strand has all of the information. The other strand is simply um, a, a complement of it. I always point out to my students, it's complement with an E, not with an I. It's not like one strand saying, you know, you're looking very good today or something like that. But anyway, there are two complementary strands in the sense that they fit together, uh, whereas the RNA is just a single chain. However, that is important. And you say, why is that so important? Well, because when the nucleic acid is relieved of the constraint of being sort of lockstep with another strand in a double helix, it's free to take on all kinds of shapes because it can interact with other parts of itself. So the structures that RNA can achieve have a wonderful variety, more on the order of what a polypeptide or a protein molecule can achieve. And this is what allows RNA to be a biocatalyst rather than simply an informational molecule. I don't really consider this to be a, um, a, a trashing of the central dogma of molecular biology or a, it's really more just an elaboration because after all the central dogma uh, as described by Francis Crick is that DNA makes, RNA makes protein and that's still true. We didn't disprove that. We just found that protein isn't the only player in terms of cellular molecules that's able to speed up very specific biological reactions. That the, the middle guy in that stream, in, in the DNA makes RNA makes protein string, also can have the activity of being able to speed up biological reactions. So it was really a broadening of, of the definition of, of, a, of a biological catalyst uh, all enzymes are not, are not proteins. I was never interested in RNA. I, I knew very little about it, um, would occasionally belittle people in uh, neighboring research groups who were working on RNA saying, why don't you work on something really interesting like DNA? And all of my research was um, directed towards understanding chromosomes, understanding genes, DNA, um, may be interested in RNA only as far as it was the product of the expression of a gene, but not uh, uh, thereafter. So RNA really came looking for us, I think, more than we came looking for RNA. Uh, it was really in the course of mapping the uh, RNAs that were produced by a particular gene that I started working on when I set up my first independent research lab at the University of Colorado at Boulder, 1978. Started working on uh, this tetrahymena, it's a ciliated protozoan, a pond animal, tetrahymena gene that was repeated, uh, amplified 10,000 times per cell, so it provided a lot of, of the same gene doing the same thing at the same time. I thought it would be a good system for analysis. And when we looked at where the 
RNAs were produced from this gene, we found uh, that there was an uh, intervening sequence or an intron uh, interrupting the coding region. These were pretty new in biology. They had been discovered by Phil Sharp at MIT and a group at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory only a couple of years before. There were already, um, as things often explode in molecular biology, there were already more than 100 published examples in just that short couple of years. But no one knew very much about the process by which uh, they were removed from the copy, from the RNA copy of the, of the genetic material. So that was when I started being intrigued by ribonucleic acid as opposed to its uh, oxygen-lacking counterpart DNA. When we first got the copying of the DNA into RNA, the tra what's called transcription, occurring in the test tube outside of the cell, we noticed that in addition to the gene being copied into RNA, that the RNA was undergoing splicing. Now this was, so the splicing being the cutting and rejoining reaction that removes or pops out the intron and produces the mature functional form of the RNA. This reaction occurs with uh, very high fidelity, very precise positions along the RNA that are cut and rejoined. It occurs very quickly. Therefore, there must be an enzyme involved. It was, you could read in any biology textbook that all enzymes are proteins. So, of course, we searched for the protein enzyme that was responsible. And this was a very crude cellular extract, and so the protein must be in there because, after all, the RNA is undergoing splicing uh, in this crude mixture of cellular components. As we purified the, what we thought would be the substrate for this reaction, the thing, substrate being the, the thing acted upon, away from the rest of the cellular um, ingredients, the reaction continued. The RNA continued to be able to undergo splicing. So the hypothesis then was that this splicing enzyme, this protein, must be tightly associated with the RNA itself. Well, how convenient. It's coming along for the ride. You know, what a wonderful purification. Small problem, though. The attempt to prove that there was a protein attached um, would seem to be straightforward. One can, for example, treat the uh, RNA with this hypothetical protein attached with detergent. Same sort of thing you do when you're washing clothes to remove proteinaceous stains. You use a, a laundry detergent, so we threw in detergent. Didn't affect the reaction at all. Well, that's very strange for the protein hypothesis. You know, it's an unusual protein that would be detergent resistant. Well, another thing that proteins don't like is being boiled. So we boiled the mixture and cooled it down again, and the splicing persisted. Again, not very supportive of the idea that there was a tightly attached uh, protein enzyme that was responsible for the splicing. Um, you can also kill proteins or inactivate them by adding uh, enzymes, other proteins that are good at degrading protein. Uh, the analogy would be uh, enzyme-active laundry detergents that have an enzyme in them that helps metabolize a, a, a proteinaceous stain. And those also had no effect on the reaction. Well. Uh, finally, uh, the evidence was so much in the, you know, it was so hard to prove the hypothesis that there was a tightly attached protein that we were really driven almost out of desperation to the opposite hypothesis that there perhaps is no protein associated. Perhaps the RNA by itself is capable of forming a catalytic active center to promote its own cutting and pasting reaction, its own RNA splicing reaction. So now, of course, you're subject to the 